Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, July 16th, 2019, and it is 12.05 p.m. Uh, this is a special meeting of the Gender Equity Safe Communities New Americans in Education Committee. I'm Councilmember Lorena Gonzalez, Chair of this committee, and joining me at the table is my co-host and uh, committee uh, member, uh, Councilmember Abel Pacheco. Thank you for joining me, and thank you for um, the a partnership and the collaboration on this joint um, effort to frame up this conversation today. Um, so there's a few wonky logistical Robert Rules of Order uh, things that I gotta say before we can actually begin the conversation. Um, if there is no objection, the agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, today's agenda is adopted. We have one item on today's agenda, and that is to uh, have a conversation with our friends at the Coalition Against Gender-Based uh, Violence, New Beginnings, and the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and the Seattle uh, City Attorney Domestic Violence Unit, and the Seattle Police Department's Victim Support Unit, um, to have a conversation on domestic violence services and gaps in the system. We'll be holding public comment at the end of today's Lunch and Learn for those of you who might have signed up to provide us public comment. Uh, so we'll go ahead and begin with uh, the panel first and then we'll do public comment last. So I will ask Roxana to read agenda item one into the record and then I would invite folks from uh, who are here representing those organizations to make your way to the table as she does that. Agenda item one, okay. domestic violence services and gaps for briefing and discussion. Great, thank you, Roxana. And we have our friends making their way up to the committee table. And then you'll just, I just ask that you not sit in this first seat because that's Roxana's seat, but otherwise any seat you'd like. <clears throat> and then we do have a PowerPoint presentation, yes. So Roxana will help with making sure that is fired up for us and then somebody will need to sit close to that computer to drive. Great. Okay, and for those of you who haven't joined us at the table before, um, uh, you'll need to speak directly into the microphone. Oftentimes you have to get it um, uncomfortably close to your mouth. Um, but that's, they're sensitive, but not so sensitive enough that you, that you can be far away from them. There's also a little button on the stem that's gray, um, and that's how you turn the microphone on or off. In order for it to be on, the button should be green. So just make sure it's, uh, the little light is green if it's not. So we will go ahead and start with a round of introductions, and then, um, and then perhaps Councilmember Pacheco and I can make some introductory remarks around sort of what we hope to be able to frame up and um, accomplish with today's conversation, and then we'll kick it over to you all to lead us through the presentation. So let's go uh, with introductions first, so name and um, organization that you're here representing. Um, I'm Catherine Rito. I'm a prosecutor with the City of Seattle in the Domestic Violence Unit. Welcome. I'm Rosa Mullen. I'm a victim advocate for the City Attorney's Office. Beryl Cousin with the Coalition Ending Gender-Based Violence here in Seattle, King County. I'm Susan Siegel with New Beginnings. Judy Chen, Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. I'm Dana Lockhart. I manage the Victim Support Team Program with the Seattle Police Department. Great. Well, thank you all so much um, for being here. Um, so one of the central areas that my committee focuses on are issues related to gender equity as part of, um, as part of, and also the intersection of public safety. And so one of the things that uh, I have the pleasure of doing is serving on the um, Domestic Violence Prevention Council uh, with some of you, in fact. And uh, we have an opportunity in that room to talk both about the work that the city and the region is doing together to uh, prevent domestic violence and to support the resilience and the recovery of uh, those individuals who may experience uh, domestic violence. We also talk a lot about issues related to sexual assault in the same sort of vein, but today we wanted to really focus on the issues around um, domestic violence and um, how the system is or isn't working for uh, survivors or uh, current victims of domestic violence and what the city council in particular could do to better support 
organizations like yours that really do a fantastic job of, um, of working with internal agencies like the Seattle Police Department and the city attorney's office on really um, accomplishing the work of investing in and um, ensuring the recovery of, uh, of um, victims and survivors of domestic violence. Um, and really appreciated an opportunity to have a conversation with Councilmember Pacheco early on around his interest in this space as well. Um, and uh, really happy that we were able to partner together on an opportunity to um, to host this conversation and to hear fr directly from you all about um, what what we're doing well and what we could do more of. Um, and of course, this is all in um, anticipation of what will be the budget process that kicks off at the end of September. Um, and we always, I have always prioritized making additional um, investments or protecting prior investments in this space um, and uh, and wanted to be a little bit more proactive about those efforts this time around. So, Councilmember Pacheco, is there anything you'd like to add? Sorry. I, caught you, I caught you at about, it's like I did, I did, I did the thing where I caught you, <laughs> just. No, I just thank you all for being here and thank Councilmember Gonzalez uh, just for starting this discussion. So I'm hoping to be as, uh, as she said, um, in preparation for the budget and what we can do to support, but also we'll see what we can make in, in terms of additional investments. And so, thank you. All right, who wants to lead us off? Good afternoon, my name is Judy Chen. I'm with the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and I think there are slides, yes. Um, I have the pleasure of being the acting executive director of a statewide coalition. We have over 70 member programs around the state serving all 39 counties and several tribes. Of our 70 plus member programs, um, Actually, only 42 are now what we think of as traditional domestic violence shelter-based programs um, that have state contracts. Um, the balance are community-based programs in remote rural communities, tribes, and culturally specific um, communities. And actually, a full third uh, are culturally specific or tribal. Um, and we have a, a slight rural majority. Um, of uh, amazing people doing amazing work. So in this photo, you can see um, just some of the amazing work that people are doing, not just domestic violence emergency services, but also working for fair wages. Um, you can see there's a, that's a totem pole that was carved out at the Quileute Reservation by uh, men and other people in the community working to heal from intergenerational violence. Uh, next, please. Um, we're moving from being um, nationally from being uh, reactive to domestic violence and the crisis of violence to moving upstream so that all people can live and live freely without fear. Um, to do that, we are uh, really uh, rooting in cornerstones of race equity, economic justice, um, and gender and reproductive liberation. And I'm very excited to be uh, looking at new pathways around, for example, rethinking criminal legal solutions to violence so that there are more options for families and communities, especially in communities of color. Uh, the coalition is the leading voice, blah, blah, blah. We have um, kind of three <laughs> buckets around supporting our members, engaging the public, and doing visionary work. And around engaging the public, I want to thank the council um, for your work on uh, economic justice and just I'm so excited. Next slide, please. About um, the, what are now statewide rights that survivors of, of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking have um, to not be fired from their job because of their victimization or for seeking help, for example. Uh, we have a new guide for families and friends. We know from domestic violence fatality data and doing almost two decades of reviewing domestic violence um, homicides and murder suicides that survivors go um, to their friends and family uh, way more than they go to any other resources in the community. So um, reaching families and friends uh, on what to do, both for people who are struggling with um, surviving abuse and people who are struggling with hurting someone else. Um, people need to know um, how to intervene because domestic violence is 100% preventable. That's our message, it's 100% preventable. We um, look forward to seeing many of you at the Refused Abuse 5K at <laughs> T-Mobile Park Mariners uh, this, um, this Saturday. And um, we're also excited about the work that we've been doing statewide um, with the Refused Abuse program and our prevention work um, to reach uh, 
uh, people, young people in all 39 counties of the state are with um, evidence-based and promising practices around prevention. Uh, next slide, please. Um, supporting our member programs is our uh, other bucket. Um, and uh, what I want to call your attention to it mainly is the mobile advocacy work um, that is a promising practice. Um, we're gathering evidence that I'll talk about in a little bit um, through a research study and just so pleased that the city of Seattle has been a leader in supporting mobile advocacy to reach survivors so that, so, you know, just what we know is, is that when somebody is um, surviving abuse, uh, that, you know, traditionally people have to go um, to an office across town with their kids on the bus, may not have the bus money, you get there, you go and you're telling a stranger about the most intimate and um, often embarrassing details of your life and what you've been dealing with. And for, um, for many people, being able to go someplace is important, but for so many people, having someone come to where they are, especially if they don't have a car, um, they have to stay home with their kids, um, or they work the night shift, um, it's just so difficult um, to get to a domestic violence um, social service agency and having someone come to them or meet them at McDonald's and their kids can play or you know whatever it is um, to be able to talk about what's going on and get help, that that is a promising practice um, that reaches so many more people, especially people who don't speak English or have other barriers such as disabilities. Next slide, please. Um, and then our third bucket is around visionary leadership and really recognizing that domestic violence, um, to end domestic violence, we need to have um, good jobs. People need to have good jobs where they can earn living wages and have safe time off of work so that they can go and get help. Um, that there are people who are working in the fields, um, picking the apples and, and all the fruits that are on our, grace our tables, that they deserve help too. And that for um, survivors and victims like um, Charlena Lyles, who was um, killed in a police interaction in um, Seattle a few years ago, that uh, surviving violence and having many complex issues in their lives, um, that those are folks who need help and need help that makes sense for them and their families. Next slide, please. So, um, hey, this is the last one. So one of the questions that we often get is, what will reduce violence and repair the harm um, and the trauma that um, families experience from people who use abusive behaviors? Well, one of the things we know, you can see this image of, um, this was a snapshot of uh, domestic violence, homicides, and murder-suicides in Washington State. One of the things we know from uh, many years of gathering this data is, is that uh, perpetrators use guns more often than any other weapon combined, and that um, when we, what we've seen in other states is, is that when uh, people who are um, dangerous abusers have those weapons removed, that uh, there is uh, a reduction in domestic violence fatality. And domestic violence, um, harm from domestic violence abusers is one of the leading causes of death for, uh, for women in the U.S. Um, from someone that they know. Uh, we know that we need to expand um, community accountability uh, and have it not just be that the survivor is accountable for ending the violence, but the whole community is a part of that. We know that safe and affordable, affordable housing is one of the number one um, issues facing survivors, and it's the, one of the leading causes of homelessness for women and children in the United States. Uh, we know that um, survivors often say, um, for those who are able to leave an abusive relationship, what survivors have told us in focus groups is, is that the, the, one of the main reasons that they have to return is because they can't afford um, life, uh, health insurance, they can't afford uh, rent, they can't afford uh, to not live with that abusive person. So living wages and employment rights are key. In terms of needs that um, the city council might consider, uh, reliable, um, non-competitive funding that um, focuses on best and promising practices, including mobile advocacy, and flexible financial assistance. Uh, so for example, to be able to stay in your own apartment. Um, but those are uh, promising practices that should be, uh, continue to be encouraged. And we will, we're actually, um, I have some handouts for the council and for um, participants today about what is domestic violence housing first. Um, but what, what we know is, is that oftentimes um, people can stay in their own place with um, not a lot of investment um, compared to what it costs to keep people in 24-7 shelter. 
So um, sometimes, you know, it's, it's always sad to hear, to have a survivor call and say, I know I'm going to be evicted uh, because I can't afford the rent or I, I'm, um, I uh, had a big debt come up that I need to pay off. And so I'm calling ahead to see if you know of any shelters where I could go. And you know, what happens to people once they have an eviction on their, on their rental record or, or their credit, right? It's very hard to keep your family stable. So um, we're super excited about the results um, of this, of the preliminary um, evaluation, actually, I shouldn't say preliminary, uh, many years of evaluation that we've done, <laughs> including that 96% of survivors were able to retain housing after 18 months. So our, we're um, working with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and um, the feds to do a longitudinal study, and uh, the results from that study will be complete in 2021. But we'd be happy to come back um, or share um, with your offices at another time. We'll have some short-term housing outcome results in December, as well as um, some data on the impact of the flexible financial assistance. Um, that would be great to be able to get a preview of some of those um, options. I know that uh, not only statewide and nationally, one of the leading causes of uh, uh, women and children entering into um, a state of experiencing homelessness is domestic violence. Correct. And, um, you know, Seattle is not um, an outlier, uh, unfortunately, in terms of that statistic. It is also true that a large, popu a large portion of women and children facing um, and experiencing homelessness in our own city and in the county um, can say the same thing. Many yes. of them have reported experiencing violence in the home, either um, a youth um, you know, who has experienced violence at home uh, or um, you know, partner on partner um, uh, domestic violence. So I think it's really important for us to get a really clear understanding of how that impacts housing stability for individuals who um, are unfortunately um, trying to break this cycle of violence and needing all of the support they need to be able to do that. Uh, and, I, and I'm not sure if you're all aware of this or not, but um, Councilmember Herbold is leading a conversation uh, around uh, some potential legislation at the city of Seattle to, to, uh, to further extend um, some protections to victims of domestic violence in the area of eviction. So really important That's conversation. Exciting. And um, I believe she just kicked off that conversation in her committee last week. And I believe it's in her committee, but we'll make sure to share some additional information with you all to make sure that she has the benefit of this wonderful information about um, particular promising practices in the housing first model that is unique to individuals who are either at risk of experiencing domestic violence or who are actively experiencing domestic violence or um, recovering. So I um, wanted to make sure that that was on, on your all's collective radar that there is an effort at the city to really tackle this really this eviction complexity related to um, people experiencing domestic violence. Well, we're quite excited about what we hear from survivors around how this has increased their safety and uh, reduced further victimization mm -hmm. in the data. So we'll be glad to um, engage more on that. Um, I thought the council might be particularly interested in the impact for refugee and immigrant survivors who were 20%. 22% of the participants in our previous study, and I did not print out the 134-page report, but it is <laughs> online. Um, lastly, uh, you know, or two, two further points, and then I'll yield to, um, or turn to my colleagues, is that um, lack of capacity for meeting basic human needs for survivors and their children continues to be a huge problem statewide. Um, the turnaway rates, um, you know, are, are tremendous in our state. Um, and we also know that building more and more and more shelter isn't the answer. There will never be enough emergency shelter for the need if we are meeting people um, after they have um, all of the, the violence has increased <coughs> dramatically and all of their resources has gone, have gone down. They have no money left, no friends or family um, who uh, they're connected with because we know isolation is the first thing to kick in. Mm -hmm. And that is if we are seeing people at that point, um, their needs are tremendous, and the, there's, it's so hard to fulfill those needs. When we go upstream and help people before they've been evicted, um, before the violence has peaked, uh, before um, their children have experienced tremendous trauma, um, that is, uh, that's the promise of what we could do. And um, those kinds of investments in prevention and um, earlier interventions make a huge difference. Um, and 
Uh, lastly, um, rethinking criminal legal solutions to violence is something that we're beginning to um, engage a lot more with our colleagues around the state and the criminal legal system as well as in communities, knowing that um, for so many people that needs to be an option and, and all of us as, um, as citizens and residents have the right to access criminal legal, the criminal legal system to protect ourselves, but um, there needs to be something else on the menu besides that. There need to be other options, so uh, really looking at housing, um, living wages, uh, economic uh, options, um, opportunity uh, for um, all families. Thank you. I, I appreciate <clears throat> that um, highlight, that last point, because I know that there has been a lot of conversation within this community about um, you know, the viability of in that cr criminal legal system conversation. How do we, you know, if, if the conversation has been historically focused on victims and victims only, um, are we leaving sort of other creative, innovative options on the table that could um, fall into the rubric of preventative um, measures that we could take into place to prevent the violence from occurring in the first place, which is really what I think the interest and the goal ultimately is, as opposed to having the blunt instrument of um, you know, punitively penalizing people who might actually be susceptible and amenable to some other type of intervention that is not quite as a blunt instrument. Not saying that that is the answer to every single situation, um, but but certainly you know appreciate the spirit of having conversations that um, lend themselves to a more holistic approach um, to be able to to really uh, pivot and turn the tide on these issues. If I could. Uh um, address that point very briefly because I know my time is probably up. Um, I think one of the one of the lenses that I try to look at it with is, um, of course, we want people who are causing harm and and um, mm -hmm. through criminal activity um, to be accountable. Right. Um, and uh, we know that there's it's a very complex issue, and that for so many survivors, um, so I want that accountability. Mm -hmm. And for many survivors, they can't access that system safely. So what about them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Excellent point. Councilmember Pacheco, anything before we move to the next organization? Okay, great. Meryl, you're going to kick us off next. I think I'm up next. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, uh, so again, my name is Meryl Cousin, and I have the honor of serving as the director of the Coalition Ending Gender-Based Violence. We used to be the King County Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, so, uh, and we expanded our mission to include sexual assault and abuse and other forms of gender-based violence um, in our mission. So we are a parallel um, sister agency to the state um, coalition and our state sexual assault coalition working um, at the regional, so uh, Seattle King County level on these issues. Um, and uh, this is just a list of, um, this isn't even all of our members. These are our <laughs> member programs that um, provide some kind of services to survivors of um, gender-based violence. So survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking, um, and also um, anti-LGBTQ violence. Um, and, uh, like the state coalition, and so, and many of these organizations are also members of the state coalition. Um, and so we definitely work in partnership and a lot of what the state coalition does is sort of set the, um, the broader, or the state coalition set the sort of broader vision and, um, and statewide agenda. And then we work with our members here in Seattle and King County um, to support their implementation. Um, so everything that Judy said about sort of the roots in, in sort of how we approach this work is being rooted in um, our racial, economic, gender, and social justice, I think, would hold for us. Um, and uh, like the state coalition, we do not provide direct services ourselves. Our, um, our we work with our member programs to support them to do the work of um, supporting individual survivors and their families. Um, so our mission is to end gender-based violence and promote equitable relationships through collective action for social change. And like the state coalition, we identify several buckets of how our work fits. Um, and we do that by leading um, policy efforts at the city and county level, 
by connecting um, our members with each other um, to share resources, coordinate services, um, set common agendas around local policy issues, and, um, and also to connect our members to the other human services organizations and other organizations working for um, immigrant justice, racial and economic justice. Um, and then finally, we also work to build the capacity of our member programs um, and other um, professionals and um, folks in communities who come into contact with, with survivors and their families. Um, some particular areas of focus that we, ha we have had some dedicated um, staff time working on um, revolve around issues related to family law, um, the intersection of behavioral health and uh, gender-based violence, um, housing and homelessness is our newest. Um, we've always been involved in that work and we just, today actually, our new housing service systems coordinator just started. Um, we got a, a funded through HUD actually to, to do that work. So we'll definitely be connecting with the work that the council wants to be doing on that. Great, congratulations. Um, thank you. <laughs> and um, we've actually been having some focused conversations among our members around transformative justice, um, alternatives to incarceration and, and um, engaging communities in and, um, more proactively responding to and preventing um, gender-based violence and, and raising up the work of the organizations that are doing that. Um, and uh, so next, so um, we hear all the time from our members and uh, a few years ago we did focus groups from uh, of survivors and uh, you know it's what you all know and sort of echoing what Julie said is just uh, Judy sorry uh, <laughs> I've only known you for what 20 something years uh, <laughs> um, I uh, you know the the, we are so lucky in this community to have so many organizations that are respond, you know, that are providing just a whole host of services. Um, many of them rooted in specific uh, racial, ethnic, and cultural communities. Others serving specific geographic areas, um, and th it means there there really are a lot of options out there for survivors, and everyone is stretched beyond capacity. Mm -hmm. And um, so definitely, I mean, it, thanks largely, uh, you know, significantly to, to, your, to your work, we have um, expanded the um, level of services that are available, particularly focused around um, the survivor-driven um, mobile flexible advocacy, and um, there's still more that's needed. Um, and, and basically, the, the range of housing options um, is sort of one of the number one things we hear from survivors, um, legal advocacy and representation, um, especially, and not so much, not as much around the, cr the criminal legal system as we hear about it um, related to family law and immigration issues, that that's um, where survivors are really being impacted um, for the long term. So are those, um, are those issues related to, um, Divorce proceedings, or can you tell can you tell us a little bit more about yeah, the particulars um, of of the complexities? Most, most, yeah, so mostly family law, so mostly divorce or dis dissolution, custody, uh, um, people who have abused their partners. Uh, I, the majority of contested custody mm -hmm. cases um, involve domestic violence, and oftentimes. Um, it may be the first time that the violence is disclosed is in a divorce proceeding because it's the first time that it's been safe to talk about that. So there is not necessarily a lot of other evidence. And um, the there's a lot of focus in our family court on um, cooperation between parents. And so, and um, so, so some of the, I think, orientations of the court that may be there for, um, very good reasons, like when domestic violence is happening um, and not understanding the trauma that the survivor is often experienced, um, it can really work against survivors. And we're really seeing survivors struggle in that system. We're also seeing um, people who are abusive becoming really adept at using the system to further their abuse. And so basically it's a tactic of control um, to keep the proceedings going if the survivor has resources, I, I mean, we have seen folks 
literally, I mean, again, hearing about it through our member programs, um, spending tens of thousands of dollars and over years and years um, trying to protect their kids um, in the court system and constantly being um, pulled back in. So there's a whole bunch of work there. And then, of course, um, it, the immigration issues, there's just not nearly enough. And then the whole system is so backlogged. And so um, in the immigration context, is that focus, is that primarily around the uh, being able to achieve relief under Violence Against Women's Act, yeah. or are there other components that are being um, triggered? If there's uh, any kind of custody um, issue that also involves, um, you know, in, uh, international, um, a, an international relationship or something like that, there's mm -hmm. a lot that comes up in the confluence of immigration um, status yeah. and family law when the, when they're splitting up. So yeah, but a lot of it is the U visa status and uh, um, or even like trying to figure out is there any kind of relief that some survivors can get even if they don't have status and you know so, some of those kinds of things. I think I don't know if you have anything to add to that. But um. <laughs> just giving you the thumbs up. You, you have given a comprehensive response. Um, you know, I just wanted to flag here that in the space of um, investing in additional legal services. Um, I've, I've been a really huge advocate and yes. pretty dogged about my um, mm -hmm. perspective on this one, that I think we need to be investing much more in legal representation of, um, you know, to provide people meaningful access to right. um, appropriate and quality legal representation. It's, you know, part of, uh, so I've done that in a couple ways. One is through the establishment of the Legal Defense <laughs> Network. Mm -hmm. that's primarily focused on providing free legal services in the area of immigration, specifically to individuals who are at risk of deportation or who are actively in deportation proceedings. One of the things that we discovered in that space is sort of a takeaway lesson was how many individuals were coming to participate in the program under the U-Visa program that really needed to have mental health services as well. And, um, and so one of the things that we have done to modify the program a little bit is to make sure that we're a little bit more flexible around connecting the dots of, you know, when you are applying for a U visa, you need somebody to be able to vouch for the fact that there has been harm caused to you and that somebody tends to be a licensed therapist or a counselor or somebody else who is actively providing you therapy. And so setting aside sort of the legal requirements and those check boxes that you have to go through, there's the actual basic need of mental health services for individuals who've been um, severely traumatized as a result of violence that um, that they've been subjected to. And so I just wanted to flag that for you all as something that we know needs to be further developed in that space. And there's also, um, you know, the, the investments we've been making around um, uh, protection orders and other issues for um, organizations like the Sexual Assault uh, Law Center to be able to represent individuals who are going through that process um, and continue to connect them with much needed services. And I recognize that it's sort of dimes in a bucket. Um, uh, that you know we need a lot more to go into this space given given the amount of need and um, and I'm really interested in continuing to make sure that we're prioritizing the legal rep advocacy and representation aspects for survivors. I also think there's six systems reform that needs to happen sure. because you shouldn't have to spend tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a divorce <laughs> and yeah. um, there is, it's a whole other conversation right. and it's actually more at the, the county level and the state level I think is where most of the remedies are, are going to come and less at the city level. But um, you know, there's all kinds of professionals being pulled into these mm -hmm. um, cases, a, a lot of these family law cases that yeah, it's a whole yeah. other conversation. We'll bookmark um, that for later. Yeah, um. happy to happy to have a follow up off the record conversation with you. The other thing that the, that we are actively doing right now at the city is um, beginning the process of formulating our state and federal lobbying agendas. And so I think there's an opportunity for us to to we always prioritize this this category in general, but if there is going to, if there is a specific 
bill or legislative fix that that um, could benefit from having the city of Seattle um, weigh in on and dedicate some of our lobbying resources to, that is certainly uh, something that we would be happy to do and that we have historically done in many um, of these spaces. So happy to hear a little bit more about that as, as we um, gear up for uh, conversations with our Office of Intergovernmental Relations around crafting those specific proposals. Great, and we'll work with the state folks too because they really take the lead on state Cool. Fantastic, so, yeah. Great. Um, so I, I don't have to go through everything else. I think Judy framed it really well. I mean, the bottom line is we, we absolutely know that survivors really, really benefit from, um, uh, you know, trauma-informed domestic violence advocacy and, and support services. Um, we also do have now, thanks to the county's, um, uh, some funding from the county's mental illness and drug dependency, um, fund. We have uh, some mental health um, therapists based at several domestic violence programs, which is a new thing. And then our position that focuses on, um, you know, making sure that both folks in the mental behavioral health um, field know how to respond to survivors of identify domestic violence and um, respond to survivors, and um, and that folks in the advocacy field, the the survivor advocacy field, um, are better prepared to handle um, mental health crises. And, and needs of the survivors they work with. Um, but the bottom line is if people can't feed their kids, if they can't afford rent, if they can't get a living wage, um, it's really hard to have any, you know, any success with these other things. So both and, not either or. And we are also trying to um, work. Um, I think this community leads sort of the nation in terms of um, some of the really innovative, culturally specific services um, and prevention programs that have been started here. Some have become national models. Um, and we are always looking to talk about community engagement transformative justice prevention and um, move our interventions further upstream, in, up, you know, including true um, violence prevention and, and changing community norms. At the same time, we need to address the real um, needs and suffering of yeah. folks who are, who are currently being impacted. Um, and I think for individual agencies, that, that can be a struggle, is how do you do some of both, because the needs are so great. Um, so moving on, um, I think that like the state coalition, um, we are looking at um, beyond the criminal legal system. Um, and so certainly we want the criminal legal system to be um, responsive in the way that it's supposed to be and um, accountable. Um, and we don't think it's contradictory to both be like supporting police accountability and um, responding appropriately to domestic violence and sexual assault cases throughout that system. Um, and but really, at the local policy options, I mean, Seattle has already taken the lead as as Judy bookmarked on a couple of things like the safe sick and um, sick and the Seattle sick, sick, sick and safe time. time. <laughs> <laughs> How many s words can be in that? Sentence? Yeah, it's a mouthful. Um, yeah, and some of the um, you know anti discrimination protections mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, uh, health, housing, and human services policies, including policies that say that human services contracts should rise with inflation. So thank you very much for that yeah. yesterday. That was a great result. Thank <laughs> yeah. you all for your yeah, advocacy well, thank around you. that. Thank for you. For your leadership. Um, uh, you know, a lot, I think, uh, certainly policy related to affordable housing and homelessness. And like one of the things that I kind of talk about is uh, DV competency, that like there is so much intersection between domestic violence and housing, homelessness issues between domestic violence and um, mental health and substance abuse issues and, um, you know, children's issues that folks in all professionals have to have a certain level of um, understanding of how to recognize uh, domestic violence and how to respond within their roles. They're not all expected to be domestic violence advocates, but their responses um, within their roles. And that's not necessarily something you get in social work school or you get in law school or you get in, um, you know, mental health programs or things like that. So, um, and um, I also think that, the, you know, this, the city council has a role in terms of raising awareness and visibility of the issue. Um, because unlike 
um, the way you know chronic homelessness shows up with folks um, being living on the streets. It's not domestic violence, sexual assault, other forms of gender-based violence aren't necessarily as in our faces. And so it really takes bringing it up and raising visibility. Um, the other thing that locally there has been a lot of leadership on um, here and, and uh, at the county uh, has been around firearms and um, domestic violence and getting guns out of the hands of um, people who are abusive. And, um, uh, we, and we've been working with the city attorney's office and um, SPD around those issues, around issues of who survi of survivors who have been arrested and criminalized, um, because many survivors are often um, are arrested actually for domestic violence or for um, other crimes that are directly related to the violence that they're experiencing, and then um, so many also find them their themselves criminalized in the act of trying to survive. Um, and so really trying to um, up our ability to support survivors um, uh, who have been um, criminalized. And um, we have been working with the um, Seattle criminal, uh, the DVPC's criminal justice committee around um, like model uh, intervention program for people who have been abusive and around the, um, these issues. So there's a lot of great um, collaboration there. And finally, I'll just say in terms of funding priorities, and I, um, I think we've talked to you about this before, but our number one funding priority for 2020 on top of no cuts to human services and the inflation ordinance, um, the inflation adjustment um, is to, um, around domestic violence is a central regional domestic violence helpline. Um, this is the culmination of more than two years of planning in the community um, for many, many reasons, including um, the specific uh, dangers that uh, survivors face, um, the fact that it there is more um, reluctance, particularly on the part of immigrant and refugee survivors, um, other marginalized folks to approach formal systems. Um, and because of the lack of capacity, frankly, to meet um, the needs of every survivor with in-person, live advocacy, let alone um, uh, housing or um, or other kind or legal representation that um, a helpline is the entry point for many survivors and for some survivors it may be the only kind of domestic violence service that they can um, access and um, there is not currently a dedicated 24-hour um, uh, central helpline or hotline for survivors of domestic violence in this region. There are several agencies that are mandated to staff their phones 24 hours, but they're not funded. So frankly, I, I mean, they do the best they can given the circumstances, but um, it's usually people, um, you know, a combination of volunteers, folks who are on call, and folks who are doing this as part of their other job. Um, many calls, um, go unanswered and it also like it, it's you many survivors get really great trauma-informed helpful responses and many don't and many get a busy signal or a voicemail and it's right now frankly it's a crapshoot <laughs> and um, so we did a multi-year multi-agency planning process um, for what it would take to actually implement a dedicated um, 24 hour um, uh, well staffed crisis or helpline um, here in um, Seattle King County. And um, we have almost like three quarters of the funding secured largely through the county's um, Vets, Seniors, and Human Services levy. They d dedicated a big portion of that. We have about 350,000 more that we need to identify by early 2020. Um, in order for it to really be feasible to implement. And um, given the number of programs and, um, and survivors that are in Seattle, um, and, and I think it would be um, 
I think it's a reasonable <laughs> um, recommendation to, um, to the council. It was recommended by the human services staff um, for the mayor's budget and we're, you know, we've certainly communicated this um, to her. And um, also want to just call out that it's not only a resource for survivors, um, it's a resource for first responders. Um, currently, I think law enforcement, you know, they're required to right. get, give information. And there's a list of like that list of, the, of our members. There's a list of like 20 agencies mm -hmm. and then survivors don't know who to call. And they end up having to call multiple ones because of capacity. So this would give them a trauma-informed response, someone who could spend an hour safety plan with them if that's mm -hmm. what's needed, um, who, who, if they're having an emotional crisis, can talk to them. And we also want to um, uh, integrate a chat function and um, it will increase access. And we did some focus groups. I won't read this to you, but this, is, this just shows um, some of what the difference is um, between <laughs> someone getting a great um, response from a helpline and mm -hmm. somebody getting a busy signal or um, a, uh, 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 you know, uh, someone saying, uh, you know, we don't have shelter now, you have to call somebody else and, mm -hmm. and getting off the phone quickly because there's three other lines right. ringing. So um, uh, that's our plug. And I know, I, Pacheco. I know I took more than my time. So oh, that's, sorry. A, that's okay. Councilor Pacheco has a question. Really brief question. Are there other regions across the country that have uh, a hotline like this, a service line? Yeah, there are a number of um, statewide hotlines, and we actually consulted with um, a couple of them. Um, many states don't have as many programs as we do here in King County. Um, and there used to be a state domestic violence hotline here in Washington state and um, for a number of reasons, um, including, I mean, it was just, um, I think, complicated to run and um, most calls really were coming, coming in through the day. And so, it, you know, it was deprioritized and doesn't exist anymore, although the number, unfortunately, is still out there. Um, uh, in a lot of ways. So um, uh, given the number of programs that we have here, the level of complexity, and frankly, I think the complexity of like the housing homelessness system and the, the mental health system here, it really felt like we needed a, um, a, a dedicated line locally where people would really know and be able to stay on top of like, you know, how the coordinated entry for homelessness. Mm -hmm. It like changed again, I think last week. <laughs> um, you know, so um, it, it really would be a way to help folks navigate the other services that they need in a really, really informed way and tell people what they can and can't expect. I do know, that I, I do think there are some other county level hotlines out there. I know that Portland, um, Multnomah County had a crisis line. I'm, I'm not sure if that's still going. Um, do you know of any others? And um, and then there's also some state some state helplines, um, so yeah. Any other questions, Councilman Pacheco? Okay. Um, well, thank you, Merrill, for that um, information and that presentation. I know that you and I have had conversations about the hotline in the past. Um, um, and I think with the knowledge now that King County has also invested in the program, it, um, it makes a lot of sense for us at the City of Seattle to take a hard look at what resources we could contribute knowing um, that we have the need as well. Um, and even though there are statewide organizations that I think do provide some level of a hotline, um, it is important to make sure that the organizations that we are um, referring folks to are from the communities that people are living within, mm -hmm. um, which which is, you know, I think a, that geographic um, component I think is super important. I've heard some really compelling stories um, from folks about how a hotline um, made a difference for them in, in their experience and being able to uh, do that safety planning and um, and um, move on to healing. Um, I've also heard stories about how badly it can go. Um, and so I think it's really important yeah. as this concept continues to be implemented to obviously uh, make sure that it's a model that is really gonna be truly responsive to the, to the unique and local needs of the individuals who are calling. And, um, and I like the point that you made around the first responders in particular. I think um, officers oftentimes want to be able to connect people to the right, place and 
person. Um, and it does feel a little frustrating that you have to hand out sort of a, here's a directory of every single nonprofit agency I can think of that's in King County that might be able to help you. Good luck, right? Like that, that is not a meaningful resource. It's a resource, but it's, it, it does shift the burden to um, the domestic violence victim in a way that I think is, is really unfair to that person. And we, and we have been focused on um, really looking at um, language access and how we make it accessible um, in, in terms of language as well as um, you know cultural appropriateness and things like that. And it really is a community effort and it is gonna take all of our community partners to um, you know, be working with the helpline mm -hmm. um, staff to make sure that they know what the folks that they're seeing in their communities need. Dana, did you want to chime in? I just knew, I was also going to put in a pitch for this as well, um, but it looks like I probably won't have time. Mm -hmm. um, but I did want to also um, just say that this does help fulfill the requirements of the WAC. As the WAC is written around mandatory arrest now, mm -hmm. um, law enforcement is required to offer the state hotline. The state hotline is no longer in service. Mm -hmm. And so this would help to kind of make sure that we're getting up to the requirements of the WAC. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Great point. Okay, let's move Sorry. along. Right. Sorry, I noticed that we're running really short of time, so it would be helpful to know um, because there's several of us yeah. that have to that haven't spoken yet. So, um, what could you suggest to us about? Yeah, how uh, much how much time do you got left here? I got time. Um, I think I think we I think we can, and I don't think the chambers are reserved for anything else. So I think we've I think we've probably got to get. I think we can go until about 12.15-ish, um, maybe a little bit longer, but I think we're, we're safe. Okay. Until somebody comes in here and tells me otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. I'm Susan Siegel, Executive Director of New Beginnings. And New Beginnings was founded as a grassroots effort in 1976 to address a documented need to provide safe haven for women and children fleeing abuse. And what began as a, a small communal shelter 43 years ago has evolved into a multi-service agency, which includes a 24-hour helpline, individual and group support, children's services, homelessness prevention, short-term bridge housing with a rapid rehousing component, legal advocacy, therapy, community education and training, as well as prevention education for youth. New Beginnings also coordinates three um, uh, clinics for survivors really throughout King County, a DV family law clinic, a DV protection order clinic, and a technology enabled coercive control clinic. Um, we're also a proud participant in the latest iteration of the DV Housing First demonstration project and the longitudinal research that, uh, that Judy spoke to and that will be available in 2021. In 2018, we answered close to 5,500 crisis calls on our 24-hour helpline. Um, we provided in-person support to 525 adults and 174 children. 80% of the survivors that we served uh, were low income and 50% were people of color. And we also touched 3,200 uh, adults and youth through our community education and prevention efforts. If we can go to the, to the next slide. What follows will echo quite a bit of what Judy and, and Merle spoke to, so I, I think I'm not, you know, in, in the interest of <laughs> enabling other folks to speak, I'm not gonna go over all of these points again. Um, other than to say that, um, or to, to remind us that domestic violence remains a hidden epidemic in our community. And um, two of the best things that we can do are really within our reach as a community. One is to, to use an unfortunate uh, military <laughs> phrase, we need more boots on the ground in terms of advocates and educators that are reaching out far into the community to, to educate about domestic violence, to talk about services that are available, to ensure that community members have the knowledge and skills to, to support survivors. Um, and 
we need that countywide helpline. Um, one of the things that uh, Merrill really described it in um, very eloquently. So the only thing that I will add to that, though, is that in the planning for that helpline, we have always conceived that it would have a strong, uh, assuming that we are able to obtain the full budget that we need, that it would have a strong kind of promotional component to it. Um, so that we'd really be able to lift this up as a high-profile resource for survivors, both through broad outreach in the community as well as, as more culturally specific um, community outreach as well. So this, in you know, is not only an incredibly essential service, but it also could present us with a mechanism for reaching a much broader swath of the community and to make them aware of the kinds of supports and services. Are, that are available. So moving the dial, I think that uh, my colleagues have touched on a lot of these kinds of things. Um, some of these are, you know, represent obviously broader cultural change that we all need to be a part of and city council can do a lot um, in, in the way of, of talking up these issues and, and modeling um, this kind of um, action. Um, we really, we really need, as, as Judy and Merle both said, to aim as much of our efforts as far upstream as we possibly can do. And it really is going to involve the, the full village of, of our community to do that. So I'm, I'm going to cut it shorter than I would have just so that other folks have a chance to, okay. to speak. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. I really appreciate all the work that you all have been doing. I know that you've been good partners to the city and to others in, um, in doing this work um, and have had the pleasure of um, hearing you speak at the DVPC meetings on really important issues. I think the last one that um, we heard from you all about is around the technology components, which was fascinating, uh, <laughs> terrifying, but <Yes. laughs> fascinating in terms of the emerging area of work that is yeah. that is uh, happening in this space around how technology, uh, while um, it can be a wonderful, helpful tool to create efficiencies in many other areas of our lives, it is really being weaponized in this space of domestic violence. And um, hearing some of the innovative work that you all are doing uh, was really, uh, inspiring and uh, promising in terms of figuring out how do we, how do we, how do we really think about these tools that many of us around this table use on a daily basis without without even blinking or batting an eye at, um, and thinking about how those those same tools are used to just terrorize people. Um, and of course, that means that the population of people who are causing harm is becoming younger and younger and younger. Um, and so I, I thought we learned a ton from that conversation, including how uh, youngsters think about bullying and how it's not really, they don't use that word, <laughs> really. Uh, what was it? Drama? They use the term <laughs> drama. Yeah, there's a lot, of, there's not a lot of bullying, but there's a lot of drama. Um, a lot of drama. <laughs> a lot of drama. And I think us old folks use that term as well, but perhaps in a different way. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much uh, for being with us and for the work that you do thank as well. You. And, right. and just a, a very quick thank you also for the annual inflation adjustment legislation. That is critical. Thank you. Yeah, of course. We're, we're happy to do it. Now we just got to make sure it gets into the budget. <laughs> All right. Let's hear from the good folks over at SPD now. Hi there, I'm here to tell you about the victim support team. Um, so the VST program provides a victim-centered, trauma-informed, collaborative response that meets the emergency needs for survivors following a traumatic event. VST was designed to address the gaps in services that occur on the weekends when domestic violence calls are happening the most frequently and when community programs are hardest to access. Um, on the weekends, these volunteer teams are called to respond to crime scenes at officers' requests. The presence of these community volunteers um, help break the cycle of violence and allow survivors to feel supported by their community as well as by the Seattle Police Department. During the week, we have a follow-up advocate. She responds to incoming calls from survivors and from community advocates to answer questions about ongoing cases, about court order service, um, firearm seizure and surrender, and other criminal justice system information. 
Uh, the VST program is part of the Domestic Violence Unit, uh, which is part of the Seattle Police Department. It has been part of SPD's response to domestic violence since 1996. Last year, VST program received over 1,200 referrals. In addition, the VST staff responded to over 50 requests from, community, uh, for, uh, from the community for training, outreach, system improvement, and gender-based violence prevention efforts. And currently, our VST program has over 60 community volunteers, many of whom have been with us for about five years or more. Um, and I start with this statistic, I think it's really important. It's a cornerstone of how we approach our interventions and also how I train patrol officers to utilize our program. I need them to know that we will never respond to a traumatic event or a violent event with urgency or pressure for the survivor to make drastic changes in their life that they're not ready for. Rarely does the moment of crisis and heightened violence also correlate with the exact moment when a survivor has all the tools and resources and information they need to act on that plan to keep them safe. So we're planting seeds, we're providing critical information, and most importantly, we're connecting them to the long-term community support and advocacy from programs like Susan's and other programs that are member organizations with the coalition. So the domestic violence calls that the victim support team respond to are not only person-to-person -person intimate partner violence. Um, SPD officers are responding to multiple forms of coercive control and um, gender-based violence. Many of them are overlapping. For survivors of intimate partner violence, uh, the VST program can help to identify uh, safe housing options. We can walk <clears throat> someone through what the process is to obtain the domestic violence protection order if that's what they choose is safest to do. Um, we can provide transportation assistance. We have taxi vouchers and now we have a contract with a rideshare company as well. Um, we have 165 community resource brochures in 18 different languages. That takes a lot of time to navigate through. Seattle has a lot of resources, but it's very complicated and it's a hard <laughs> process to figure out what is going to be the most appropriate for that person. Um, we also have a lot of several, we have several emergency resources such as food, clothing, baby needs, and cell phones. Um, for people who are experiencing stalking, uh, we can provide tools and strategies to help document future incidents and information about anti-harassment and stalking orders. We are also frequently engaging with tech or cyber abuse, and we do call this technology-enabled coercive control, or tech. So if you see it written like that, I didn't spell tech wrong. Um, <laughs> in these situations, VST can provide tech-specific safety planning strategies that include identifying potential compromises in their devices and resources to help document online harassment and impersonation. VST also supports survivors of sexual assault by offering transportation to a sexual assault nursing exam. Um, and we also accompany when uh, a victim is reporting to law enforcement their assault. Uh, we support children who are abused by waiting with the kiddos for CPS at the precincts. And a lot of people don't know, kids are oftentimes waiting at these precincts for CPS to arrive for over four hours. Um, VST is available to assist with officers to help reduce the traumatic impact of that experience for children. For families impacted by adolescent family violence, we can provide resources for parents and other family members, and we can also offer safety planning that involves alternatives to youth incarceration in partnership with Step Up and FERS. Um, and when working with victims of elder and vulnerable adult abuse, we can connect the survivor and supportive family members with the SPD Elder Abuse Advocate and Seattle Senior Services. So I have lots of recommendations, but we don't have much time. So I'll start personal here, is that um, we're asking for ongoing operational budget for the Victim Support Team Program. Currently, SPD's budget supports the three full-time position, myself included. All other costs associated with the victim assistance and volunteer training are not in our current budget. The Seattle Police Foundation acts as a fiscal sponsor for my program and helps to raise the t roughly $20,000 necessary for annual operation costs and victim service delivery. So we will be asking for support to encourage SPD to pay for the volunteer training and retention expenses as well as the necessary victim services. Um, also, specific to SPD, um, we're asking for additional advocacy staff for the Seattle Police Department. The Domestic Violence Unit currently only staffs two felony advocates, 
each of them last year with a caseload of 450 people. Their workload continues to expand and the structure of the program that was designed in like the early 90s, I believe, was designed at a time when the population of the city was nearly a quarter less than what it was today, what it is today. Their increasingly high caseloads create a gap in services for victims, most significantly during initial investigation, when suspects are at large and often pose the greatest list risk to survivors. We'll be looking at opportunities to fund a third felony advocate to address this current need and enhance the level of advocacy SPD can provide. And we'll also be looking for opportunities for a fourth VST position that can focus their work on systems improvement as for a more trauma-informed victim-focused response to gender-based violence within the department. Um, I think we spoke about housing. I might. I think maybe I might have a bit of an angle too that's more specific to us, but from a first responder and emergency service and referral program perspective, on the weekends when community programs, their doors are shut for the most part, um, the fact that the emergency housing has gone away um, in a lot of regards is, is very challenging. Um, we are... Uh, relying more heavily on using motels. Um, and this is again through donations through the Seattle Police Foundation. Um, we're finding that this model of, is putting a strain on existing hotel business partners who are beginning to deny this type of hotel stays for the community programs that we're working with. Um, that they're using this temporary model of hotel placement as well. Um, it's not sustainable for our city, and it's not what's best for survivors who really need the stability to heal. Um, so flexible funding, mobile advocacy are proving to be very successful. I, it's, it's like what Meryl said, the yes and, um, that we also need to continue to expand our capacity to respond to the most vulnerable and the most pressing and life-threatening situations that we see every weekend um, that require immediate response. Um, I'm recommending the modernization of our criminal justice system communication tools as well. Uh, the criminal, ju criminal justice system remains difficult to navigate. Survivors are left with questions unanswered and are often confused about their criminal case. A comprehensive online portal could provide a streamlined way for victims to look up a variety of information, including who they can reach out to for further support throughout this process, connections to community programs. Um, there's a few successful examples that we've been researching, one of which is Case Companion in Multnomah County down in Oregon. It was built by Code for America. Um, and then the Family Justice Center in New York City has also recently launched an online portal called NYC Hope um, in partnership with Cornell Tech. Uh, my fifth recommendation will be the, um, this is per recommendation of the recent, recent research that you're aware of, I know already, mm -hmm. um, Councilmember Gonzalez, of the Seattle Technology Enabled Coercive Control Working Group, um, is that we need to improve the criminal justice system's response to tech abuse, including standardizing trainings and best practices. Uh, outlined in the research, survivors experiencing tech abuse describe filing numerous police reports with law enforcement either failing to connect a pattern of crime or dismissing the reports as non-criminal behavior altogether. The lack of a comprehensive response is re-traumatizing these survivors. We are recommending more resources to investigate and prosecute these crimes, particularly at a misdemeanor level. Um, the research also recommends the modernization of the civil protection order process to enable survivors of tech abuse to reliably submit digital evidence into record. Mm. We've already discussed my last recommendation, so I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Dana? All right. Let's shift over to the folks at the city attorney's office. Thank you, and thank you so much for having us here today. Summer and I are both here from the city attorney's office. Uh, Summer is in the domestic violence unit as a victim advocate, and I am a domestic violence prosecutor. Uh, just to help illustrate some of our work, I wanted to share a case that Summer and I both worked on together. Uh, in every domestic violence case that comes through our office, we always seek victim input. And so in this case, uh, we sought survivor input about the case going forward, and she was not ready to testify. 
And so we made the decision to move forward without her in that case. We had significant safety concerns. It was a case that involved the survivor being hit in the face with the butt of a shotgun. Uh, there were threats to kill. She had run to her neighbor's house for help and um, made a, a really terrified call to the police for, for help that day. We were able to move forward with this case without her because we, in our unit, we follow the sort of evidence-based prosecution model, meaning we were able to use other components of the case without her testimony. So photographs of injury, a 911 call, we were able to introduce some portions of the officer's body-worn video just to show her demeanor and her injuries on that night. And did you, it, did you need the victim's consent on the body-worn video pieces of the evidence, or is that something that the prosecutor can decide? That is a case-by-case -case basis, okay. um, and we would make that determination whether to use it or whether we even could use it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. In this case, the survivor did actually end up coming to court mm -hmm. and testifying on behalf of her abuser. Uh, that was a decision that she made, and we supported her throughout the process and supported her decision to do that. Summer and I both had a feeling she was going to come in and, and testify on behalf of her abuser. Because of the other evidence, the jury still convicted the defendant. And so prior to sentencing, Summer and I met with her again to seek her input about the city's sentencing recommendation. And something that she wanted was uh, treatment for her partner. She wanted to remain with her partner, but she did want him to get treatment. She never denied that the abuse had happened to us, but she just wasn't ready to leave him or to step away at that point. She didn't want any jail time. And so based on her input, that is exactly what we asked for at sentencing. Uh, that's just one example of the work that we do and we're not able to move forward with every single case that we get. And not every single case has enough evidence that we could proceed without the testimony of a survivor. Um, sometimes, you know, if we don't have a survivor who's willing to testify in court, that means that we can't actually move forward with, with a case and hold that abuser accountable. And at that point, we, we just don't move forward. We never force a survivor to testify in court or to do something that they're not ready to do. Um, but if we're able to go forward using that evidence-based prosecution model, then we will do that and try to get some accountability for the offender. And I would say about one-third of my trials have proceeded forward without the um, testimony of a survivor of domestic violence. And the reason that we go forward on these cases is because of the massive public safety, community safety concerns. I think that's something that everyone is aware of, that domestic violence is a, the greatest predictor of future violence to that individual or within the community. Uh, we're not able to go forward with every case. One of the issues that we face is, is a capacity issue, a staffing issue. Uh, we have five prosecutors in our unit. We have one detective who is assisting with the misdemeanor caseload that we have. And in 2018, we had 1,287 cases that were actually filed. And so in addition to those domestic violence cases, adding in non-domestic violence cases like stalking, cyber stalking, harassment, child abuse, sexual assault, animal cruelty, what that means is that each prosecutor has a caseload of about 300 cases that they're working on. Our unit is very innovative, and this city is very innovative. We're on the forefront of changing the way that we respond to and handle domestic violence and other uh, victim-involved cases. And we're changing the way that we practice in response to input from survivors and in an attempt to hold offenders accountable and increase public safety. But the issue is capacity. Uh, we need more people. I, I think that's something that we've heard from everyone. We need more people uh, assisting our unit so that we can continue to better serve survivors and better serve our community. And I'll let Summer talk about the role of the advocates. Thank you. So the victim advocates in our office, um, we have seven advocates now, and we typically will attempt to make contact with about 3,100 um, 
survivors of domestic violence every, every year. So for each report that we get, we have an advocate reaching out to try to reach that person. And we do that because we want to find out what, what do you want to see happen. Uh, we want to be able to safety plan with them. And we want to be able to connect them with community-based resources as well, because we know that the majority of people who interface with the criminal justice system do so reluctantly. And for good reason. The criminal justice system has been historically harmful to victims, to survivors. And uh, we acknowledge that. So our role as advocates is to be there as a support to help explain the system to explain the rights of the victim and to um, assist them through the life of the case. Um, for the cases that are filed, are, it can take six months to a year before a case finds a resolution in our court. That's a lot of time and a lot of waiting and a lot of questions. And so our additional role there is to make sure that during that time, the victim's input is still considered. We want survivors to feel like they're heard in our office, even if ultimately a prosecutor decides that they're going to make a different decision. It's important that a survivor have the ability to voice their opinion on the case um, and that they know what their rights are as far as how to continually voice their um, feelings about a case. When we work with survivors, we hear consistently that survivors want treatment for offenders. They don't want jail time. Jail time can be harmful. Jail time can mean that they're not working. Uh, and jail time can mean that they could lose housing. Um, they want treatment. And so the domestic violence intervention program is really exciting for our office because it gives us an ability to meet that need, a potential to invest in change in a offender accountability um, in a way that implements a community coordinated community response um, because we don't just want to put them in treatment. We want to make sure that everybody is on the same page about what happened in the relationship. We need the big picture approach to domestic violence because it's not a snapshot that you see in a police report. It is a pattern of behavior that harms our survivors and our community. Um, because of that, when we talk about capacity issues, we're talking about additional prosecution and advocacy staff to specifically address the DVIP program, to go to those meetings, to be there with historical knowledge, to be there with input from survivors about what's going on Content from previous history, whether it be prior reports that were never filed, or if it be uh, new information that the victim is sharing about how the offender's behavior has changed or hasn't changed since they started treatment, um, we think consistency is important and investing in that program in that way is one of the best things that we can do. Um, in addition to that, echoing uh, the wonderful work of VST in highlighting the issue of tech-enabled coercive control, um, we are falling short on investigating and prosecuting these crimes. Um, even if it's not a cyber stalking case, a, D a DV order violation, and we had about 500 last year, could be a text message. Um, it could be harassment online. Um, those cases require a, a great deal of manpower and technical proficiency that our office, frankly, doesn't have. Um, so when we are looking at ways that we can assist victims of domestic violence, survivors of domestic violence, we need to listen to them. And what they're saying is that they want offender treatment and that they want us to prosecute these cases. They want our help in, doing, in keeping them safe in that way. And so when we don't do anything, it puts us on the line. So those are the things that we really feel are important at this time, but we also want to invite you to come to our office and see kind of what we do and what our process is. We are really proud of the work that we do in the domestic violence unit. Um, like I said, I know that the system is, is harm, can be harmful to victims, um, but when they are interfacing with our system, we're doing the best that we can to make sure that we are um, honoring them with dignity and respect and trying to um, create outcomes that are separate from your traditional pattern of prosecution. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for um, the work that you're doing. I know it's hard work, and um, and I think the panel today really sort of exemplifies how 
uh, this is really truly a full spectrum of um, work, right? There's sort of the prevention and recovery aspects that are um, cert much more service oriented. Um, and then there, there are sort of the advocacy pieces around making sure that we're really having transformational change in our systems by changing law and policy and making investments in those things. And then there are sort of the internal processes, right? So as institutions and people who work within government institutions, we have a responsibility to not further perpetuate harm or uh, cause harm ourselves in, in the work that we're doing on the inside to hold people accountable, um, people who are creating harm. So I think this sort of really lays out the full spectrum of, um, of the universe that we are operating within and really pleased that this is one of those few spaces where I feel like there's a lot of alignment amongst internal and external stakeholders in terms of understanding what unique role each one of us plays in, uh, in really eliminating domestic violence um, and, and harm within our community. So I really want to thank you all for the work that you do every day, the hard work you do every day to advocate for, represent, and protect victims of domestic violence in, um, in our city and beyond. It's really important work, and, um, and, I, and I really am appreciative of, of all the work that you do. Councilman Pacheco, anything you'd like to add? Uh, just, for, just have a quick question. Um, one of the things that I'm going to be I'm going to be particularly mindful of is just in terms of the time of uh, the need for the for the investment, but also just um, given just that this is the longest period of economic prosperity that we've had since the depression. Do you see a correlation between when things are going well economically uh, with regards to domestic violence? Uh, it goes down, and when things are you know when we're in a recession, it, you know domestic violence goes up. Is there like research that supports that, or? Oops. You got to press that gray button on the stem. There you go. Thank you. It's technology. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Councilman. Um, there is, you know, there's interesting data about uh, what happens around domestic violence and sexual assault and child abuse during times of economic prosperity versus times of economic hardship. Um, what we do know is, is that when survivors um, have no economic means um, to be able to support their children um, then, and no other options but to stay with an abusive partner, um, then uh, we see an a increase in violence. Um, there is, you know, the, the myth around um, who's causing violence, you know, the lifetime television kind of, you know, monster guy. Um, of course, that is a subset of the population, but so often it's people who are um, believe that they have, you know, they're, they have the entitlement, they have the right um, to control the people in their lives, and um, and there's a lot of things that aren't going well for them. So, of course, when um, when there's widespread um, unemployment, for example, then uh, those stresses do um, increase the uh, domestic violence victim is uh, the, the behavior. Um, domestic, domestic violence victimization, um, but I want to emphasize that the um, what we're seeing around the both economic prosperity, but also this huge gap, huge gap between the haves and the have-nots, um, where so many people are just hanging on by their fingernails to their apartment, um, you know, working two or three jobs. Um, that um, for survivors, um, that means that they have fewer and fewer choices um, to protect themselves and their children. So investments that the city can make both um, in the, um, your public policy agenda as well as in, you know, what are we doing to help people have living wage jobs um, and employment protections and um, a safe, affordable place to live, that, that are, uh, those investments are um, going to make a big difference. When we look at the, you know, longitudinally, um, the data indicates that um, what has um, reduced domestic violence over time in the United States are um, the right to a no-fault divorce, um, the economic opportunities for women, and then the um, opportunities to have, uh, to have help. Thank you. It, just because one of the things I'm going to be trying to be mindful of is just as given the role that I have had for the last three months, 
I, want, we get the economic picture, and so I'm trying to make sure that there's this is the critical time to make the investments, given the fact that I've, there's we anticipate a bit of a slowdown. And so, how does how do we make those investments and make those indes- investments in, in a strategic manner, so therefore we're most impactful? Um, because I think so much of the work that you all talk about is the intersectionality of so much of so many of the issues that we talk about today as a, as a city and as a region, uh, more specifically homelessness. And you know that you know in this first uh, handout, it says, you know, domestic violence is a leading cause of homelessness for women and children. I think so much of, of my own lived experience with regards to my mother uh, and how many times she was on the run and with four little kids on the, uh, holding her hand. And so thank you all for the work that you do. Um, and if there's any, anything that I can do to support the work that you do, uh, please feel free to reach out. So thank you. Great. Anything else from any of you for the good of the order here? All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you, Councilmember Pacheco, for being my uh, co-host of today. I apologize to the viewing public. We went 30 minutes longer than we had intended to, but that's how much we um, uh, think uh, that this subject uh, merits. It merits a lot more time than an hour and a half, and we uh, certainly have it as a top priority um, here in our city and at the city council in particular, and really appreciate, again, once again, all your work in this space. So that is our last agenda item. We have no one who has signed up for public comment. Um, is there anyone who intended to sign up for public comment that did not? Okay, I'm not seeing anybody dashing towards those microphones, so I'm <laughs> going to close out public comment. And again, this is, our, this is our one and only item on the agenda. There is no other business before the committee, so we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.